Our featured creative is Joe Batt. He is a narrative figure sculptor and professor at South Puget Sound Community College. He currently has his bronze sculpture, Child with Egg, up on Percival Landing. Um, there is a uh, vote going on for the, cra uh, for the fan favorite. So if you haven't already voted or if you voted earlier in the year, I think they had a computer problem, go and vote if that's still up. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Joe. Thanks, Nicole. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. Um, I'll work harder on my backdrop next time. I'm, I'm still working on that. I'm going to, uh, first, I'm going to show you a few images just of the various series that I've, I've got going on. And um, I have one or two things uh, here that uh, I've been working on that I could show you as well. Uh, and then as we leave, I'll, uh, with Nicole's permission, I'll accompany the exit parade with my banjo playing, if that's okay with everybody. So I'm, I'll try not to kill everybody with PowerPoint, but this is just kind of the easiest way for me to do this, I think. <clears throat> so <clears throat> like Nicole said, I work with the narrative and uh, uh one of the words I've been using lately is excavating. Uh, I'd like to dig around and play with things and and see see what kind of comes out and and over time that dialogue with with the with viewers and uh, fellow artists and so forth as I start to realize some things resonate and and in a way that that I want to continue exploring. I work with the hair a lot, as you know. Some of them are actual kind of real looking hairs, and some of them are people. Some of them are uh, from the real world. Some of them are from the dream world. I think these two are sort of from the cartoon world. These are from demos and things that I've been doing lately. And uh, <clears throat> most of my pieces are, are pinched with uh, stoneware clay. And I work like a pinch pot to start at the bottom and pinch up and keep adding clay and pinch up. So these, this is a couple of figures that are about 25 inches tall and they're in, in progress. And you know the the thing that that I've worked on over the years is how to how to control these contours, and, uh, while this gets dry down here, and how to keep this wet up here so I can keep adding. And the complication is that the clay shrinks as it dries. So usually a pinched piece is going to look a little bit distorted, and that's kind of cool because I don't work very well in, in total realism and perfect proportion. Uh, so pinching kind of works nicely uh, for me. So this is that piece finished. And uh, this, this I did about a, a year and a half ago uh, and it's called Connectivity. I love, isn't the, the wet clay just gorgeous? I just wish things would just stay that way forever. I guess they would if, if I used clay that had oil in it or something. And these are made in sections so that heads come off here, the hands come off, just so they'll fit in my kiln and I can move them around. Uh, but to me, there's a story happening with these two about um, uh, how we engage with each other, how we, uh, in, in essence, kind of need each other. And it's in that context of technology and digital media, which are fascinating to me. And so eventually I put dinosaurs and, and uh, astronauts on them, uh, on their pajamas, because th th that relates to me to this story of technology and the history of people and of course, they're standing on a photo of uh, digital junk, digital waste, which is also uh, colored with colored pencil. So there's colored pencil on the clay and there's colored pencil on the, on the photos. That's one of the things, when I use color lately, it's been, for the last several years, it's been with colored pencil on the fired clay. And I think one of the reasons it's just, it doesn't take up much space like a glaze would, and it's not as shiny, but also I like to draw. And so that's my excuse. Uh, so that previous piece was made hollow. The, some of the pieces I do are solid. So this uh, hair that I did this fall, it was just built solid and you can work quickly and get maybe a more accurate gesture of the, the form. And then I just take a wire and just cut that in half and open it up like you see over on the right and hollow that out, just like a big chocolate bunny. So you leave about a quarter of an inch or so thick wall, maybe a little more. 
uh, end up or a little less, but fairly uniform and just compress that wall and uh, <clears throat> reattach those back together. And that's, I have less success with this because it tends to dry and crack and come apart. It drives me nuts to work solid and, and hollow out and put back together. But for some small things, it works really well. And so I love doing that. And there's that, that piece finished right there. So this is a piece I did for uh, Arts Week, Art, Arts Month this fall. Uh, you might have seen online or downtown. Uh, those bunnies are meant to go with my uh, installation I've been doing in recent years around technology. And so here's here's some of those, those forms. And uh, so I would expand this the next time I show these to have a, like a group of little uh, white bunnies sort of innocently uh, interacting with these, these predatory uh, characters. Uh, I'm going to throw in a couple of artists I really like. Patricia Piccinini is one of my favorite from Australia. These are not ceramic. These, I think, are some kind of uh, uh, silic silicone forms, but uh, they freak me out. And, uh, you know, she's really into what's going to happen in the future with, with the way that we're doing things. And that's a really, I think, a really Good question to continue asking and talking about. Here's a most recent actual installation I did, at Lower Columbia. And uh, so it has the, the clay figures and a lot of my drawings together. And then there's pieces that are drawn on wood that are hanging. And the, the, they did a great job of casting shadows from those onto the walls, which I just love. But here's another one. And then this draw, the drawings I do like this one, and this, these are drawn on heavy paper and just cut out like giant paper dolls and attached to the wall. This one's in two or three sections. It's 20 feet high. And uh, fortunately, it just fit in there. These panels up here came came like literally right up against the drawing. Um, but that was a fun challenge. And it's fun to, to finally see all my pieces together in one place. Uh, just a little bit of history. I, as a young undergrad, I heard Tony Hepburn talk. He's a ceramics teacher was a ceramics teacher from Cranbrook, I believe. And he had shown us these forms he does, these abstract forms. But in his ex exhibition, there's these beautiful charcoal drawings of the forms as well. And that directly impacted me. It took me year, like 25 years, but it, took, but it never left my mind that I would love to have that in my work. My work doesn't look like his. He's a very conceptual artist. Um, and I don't think he's, I'm pretty sure he's no longer living. But uh, that, that courage to have those big drawings and those pieces together in a space, I just thought it was really uh, uh, cool. <laughs> and so over time, I started to do that. I actually did some of my drawings on the walls in galleries where people would let me. And uh, it's just something uh, liberating about uh, big, messy charcoal drawings and uh, feels risky uh, to do it you know, along with your sculptures. This is uh, the show this last winter in Longview, and you might have seen some of these in the faculty show, but this piece is about 35 feet wide and 12 feet high. And then the ceiling was, uh, the walls here were huge. This is 12 feet or so here. Uh, and then the satellite was hanging up and here's the shadow. So you can tell the, the ceiling's really high. I try to make these as big as I can for the space that they're gonna be in. And it's really fun when, when I get into a space and my pieces look tiny because they take up so much room and when I'm trying to draw them, to try to draw really large is almost impossible because you need a, a giant wall to do it on. And so a lot of these were done in sections on the, my living room floor and I don't see them together until the show, which is pretty exciting. And so this, this is, uh, I don't know if you know, you can tell, but this is a, a cell tower and sort of that metaphor of the cloud that we're always talking about. and that. That metaphor, when people mentioned the cloud, I kept seeing different things and thinking about different things and it informed my, uh, my work on this topic of, uh, well, what are the unintended consequences of where we're heading? And is it going quicker than we can really um, contemplate and manage? And these children are wondering the same thing. And, so I want to let you know, I met some uh, some students. I did a show at Green River College last summer, 
And a really interesting art student contacted me named Eba Lukander from Seattle. And they're working with friends on a safe, authentic, intentional social network site. It's not up yet, but, but if you go to this address, uh, you can see what they've got going on with their, I guess it's called a launching pad or a landing pad or something. Anyway, <clears throat> their business model or their model is a lot more uh, in, uh, in line with what I think about when I think about using technology in a, a more uh, uh, responsible way and a less passively consumer sort of way. So that's a little bit of information. Uh, they also, if you do artwork about technology, they might be interested. They've got a an art exhibit going on on their page all the time. And so they might be interested in seeing your work if you've got something that relates to this topic. So there's more of the installation work. Uh, I want to mention Edith Garcia, a ceramic artist and mixed media artist who works with uh, 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 words, uh, ceramics figures, uh, 2D work of all different kinds, fabric and is a really great uh, installation artist. Uh, uh, Edith's work is a little, maybe a little more minimal than mine in some ways, but I just really have always admired her, her versatility, uh, working with different subjects, working in different styles and with different media. And uh, so uh, when I see her work, it get, I always get ideas, I always get inspired by it. This is one of the digital pieces. So when I exhibit this work, I usually will do some kind of mixture of sketches I've been doing and things I've been looking at into a, some kind of digital collage. And um, it's a, kind of a way of kind of nudging myself to um, take a little risk because I'm often criticizing digital media. And so I'm forcing myself in a way to create, do something creative and it's fun. And so thankfully because of apps and, you know, um, uh, simple, uh, uh, little applications you can use on a tablet or even your phone. You can do all kinds of things easy. Uh, I get a little overwhelmed by Photoshop. I use it, but I, it's a little overwhelming. And what what's fun is you can re uh, recycle things. And so this is an image of junk from, a, from you know, digital waste, which you've all probably seen images of. And I just collaged it in with a drawing and a photo and, and some of my previous pieces. Here's the, one of the kids from the earlier piece. This painting is from my grandmother. She did this painting of these poppies. And uh, it's fun to take and put her work into my work at times. And that's one of the kind of the fun things about digital technology is um, the, uh, the recycling, the ease with which one can recycle. Uh, sometimes it might not, it might be a little more appropriate, appropriational <laughs> than is healthy, but uh, I think it's really fun to bring things together in that way. This is an image, a, a painting that my grandmother did as well of my mom. And this is a drawing of my granddaughter. These are about uh, 20 by 24 inches or so. And they're just little collages I did on my iPad using Photoshop Touch, the app for an iPad. So some of my drawings uh, mixed together with some photos and some of my grandmother's paintings. Uh, and my granddaughter here is wearing uh, some digital goggles. It, one would use to watch movies or whatever while they're out, outside playing, <laughs> whatever, which I just, she asked me to get her some of some of these goggles. I never did, but I did imagine what it would be like. I wanted to share one of my favorite artists. We talk about this artist a lot in mixed media class. This is Daniel Rosen. These are kind of like digital pieces, but they're really just wood. Uh, there are sensors behind each block of wood. So when you stand in front of this piece, each block rotates to a darker side. And in, in essence, it creates a mirror. So these are called wooden mirrors. And so this viewer here uh, is seeing uh, their likeness based on how these sensors and these wood blocks are reacting to them. So when you look at the, the videos of the, his exhibitions, people are moving around almost dancing in front of these pieces to see the, the way the blocks all rotate really quickly to reflect that. Uh, Nicole had mentioned the bronze piece. And so I just wanted to show you the process for that. This piece was a, is about two feet tall and uh, there's my little maquette there. And I just took a bunch of clay and just started working real loose. So this piece was made solid. And then uh, my wife helped me move it into my car and I just took it to the foundry. And uh, in the process, 
it got banged up a little in the car and got a little deformed uh, but just because it's so heavy. So if you work solid with clay, I think it's probably better to use an armature. And I was pretty confident that I didn't need one and that was probably a mistake. But anyway, uh, if you look closely at the final piece, this foot got a little uh, distorted in the process. But anyway, this is called Child with Egg. I've, I've done this image a few times. I love this idea of children and dreams and nature. And it originates from chasing a rabbit with a, a friend of mine when we were about eight and nine. And we this rabbit jumped out of the bushes and my friend kept digging through the bushes. And I said, what are you, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm looking for, for rabbit eggs. And uh, I never forgot that because I knew at the time there's probably no such thing. And, and uh, I, I thought he was older than me. So I thought it was great that he still thought there was rabbit eggs. But I love the idea of the, the egg. I think it's beautiful. And in ceramics, that form comes up over and over again in all kinds of different, different ways with functional work and everything else. But this child is in their pajamas and uh, hanging out outside looking for eggs. Uh, so the foundry just covered this with silicone. They made a wax version of it. They invested that in plaster, burned out the wax and poured in the bronze. So that's, I can't remember, I think it's a couple thousand degrees in here. So they did it in three sections and then they welded them together and sandblasted them. And this is what it looked like when it came out of there. And then we had somebody come in and do some patina work on the surface. I'm pretty new at this. I've done some small bronze work myself, but nothing this size. This is actually pretty small relatively, but for me, it was it was it would have been a huge amount of, of work. And I'm, I just don't have the patience <laughs> to do it. So I, I got a lot of help getting this finished. And the people I work with are great up at Two Ravens in uh, Tacoma. So this was for the Plinth Project downtown. And you can see it right here during the election week. Uh, there was a little parade that came by. This is a, a Trump parade. And so what's fun about doing the Plinth Project is your piece is, becomes part of the landscape of your community in all kinds of different ways. I was down there today and there's some uh, folks making uh, Christmas wreaths down on Percival Landing right next to my piece. And they're selling them to help, I think to help the homeless. And just all kinds of cool things going on around the piece. Although in this case, I don't know if cool is the right word. Uh, interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of Jason DeCares Taylor. You might have seen this work. He casts life-size people in concrete and puts them at the bottom of the ocean. And uh, to him, the more life that grows on them, the more finished they are. So the one on the left is relatively new. And then the one on the right is has been out there for a while and you could see how much is growing on them. But this is really rigorous work, the casting and bringing these out and bringing a boat that has a crane on it so they can lower it down. And he doesn't just do two or three sculptures, he does you know, dozens of figures at a time uh, in these pieces and they're um, way down there. It's fascinating work. Uh, so I was kind of determined not to do any COVID stuff but I kept seeing things that were interesting to me. And I was driving out South Bay Road last spring and I saw a group of people, a uh, congregation that were worshiping out in a, a parking lot. And I thought it was really touching uh, and moving. So I started thinking about that and the, the chairs and the masks and the people lined up outside. So these are miniatures about seven or eight inches high. And I started making that whole congregation out of clay. These are just made solid. And they're meant eventually to go together as a full group. I've mostly photographed them as kind of little vignettes and have been uh, starting to show them around as just little uh, small pieces, individual or you know one or two together. I don't know where this body of work will lead, but it's the, if I were doing COVID work, I guess it's the kind that I decided to go with. And it's not necessarily just for COVID. It's just thinking about people uh, being vulnerable, being um, uh, brave and being together. I've noticed during this last year, uh, I really appreciate, I didn't appreciate being around people or just having a meal with other people uh, nearly as much as I, uh, as I do now. These are, like I said, these are made solid. I just poke a few needle holes in them and fire them. There's no glaze on them. 
Uh, this is inspired, uh, at least in some ways, by Isaac Cordal's work. These are miniatures as well. And he photographs them so they look like they're life size in different contexts. And my students uh, often do a project based on Isaac Cordal. Um, I love changing scale with figurative sculpture um, and, and seeing where that goes. And so that's kind of what's happening with this work. Uh, a digital piece of mine, this is a pre-Columbian uh, baby form. You may have seen this from historical photos and I did sort of an updated version. This child has uh, Oculus goggles, virtual goggles and a joystick here. And then there's one of my satellites in progress here. So that's a digital collage. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I've I'm drawn a lot to Kukuli Velarde's work. Uh, she came from Peru and went to school in in Mexico City and then moved to New York. I'm not sure exactly where she lives now, but I believe she lives in the US. But uh, she saw pre-Columbian pieces in, in museums in the US, uh, although I know she probably saw them when she was in Peru, but she really started looking at them when she was in the US and doing artwork about that. And so this is some of her pieces and I think they're really powerful. She does things about uh, gender politics, colonialization, uh, treatment of indigenous peoples and uh, her, and also exploring, I think a little bit her own uh, uh, history coming from that region. She gives great talks, does amazing work. If you ever get a chance, you can just look up, look her up. She's fascinating and really great artist. She paints also, a lot of us do more than one thing, uh, but Kukuli really does everything she does she does really well and that's uh, that's extraordinary uh, i wanted to share with you robert arneson's work or robert arneson just the name uh, his name was brought up to me a lot when i was a beginning ceramic student uh, my work was very colorful and uh, whimsical he was he taught at uc davis and uh, this is him doing a portrait of Mosco mayor Moscone. Uh, there's a famous story about this piece because it was pretty funky and people didn't like it. And, uh, it was controversial. But anyway, he was a great uh, figure artist and, and uh, someone who, who inspired me a lot. And uh, so I just I thought it might make sense to, to point out uh, Robert Arneson. And one of his students became uh, one of my teachers in grad school. So it's kind of a, there's these interesting lineages in ceramics uh, that we connect with, I think, that are important. Uh, I think, oh, uh, I wanted to show you this. This I don't know these artists. Uh, just This is one of the most moving pieces I've seen maybe ever. Uh, these artists in uh, Syria doing George Floyd pieces. And this happened during, you know, all of the, the uh, reaction to the, the murder of George Floyd last year, last uh, June. And uh, I just love the way art, even art, uh, artists you don't know can touch you from a, a long way away and connect. I think it's really powerful. Um, I'm gonna jump out of here. Um, only other thing I have to show you is um, just to give you maybe a little more of a sense of how I work. Uh, right now I'm working on a small piece that might be for the postcard show. And so what I often do is I'll, I'll look up images and just look at real things as much as I can. And then I'll do really quick kind of messy sketches. So this is a really rough gestural sketch. You can maybe tell it's a gas pump and uh, a hair. And this hair is gonna be, you know, greedily pumping gas. I've got kind of, a, after doing, reading a, a, a book called Arctic Voices this year, uh, I've got kind of a thing I want to do uh, about shell. And so <clears throat> the piece, I just spent a little tiny bit of time on it. And um, then I'm, I'll just hold it up here. So it's really rough. This is like 15, 20 minutes. So I've got my little uh, gas pump here. I'm just roughed out this hair. So this is all solid and it'll be hollowed out later. And the clay will shrink 15% by the time it's done. So it'll be even smaller. Anyway, that's what, that's kind of a little bit about the process here with these small pieces, if I'm working solid. Um, and so anyway, thanks for listening. And I guess at this point, if anyone wants to throw out a question or a comment, 
This would be a great time. Any questions for Joe? Yeah. <clears throat> a question for you, Joe. Yes. So how big do, do your pieces get before you decide to start uh, building them hollow instead of solid? What's the size um, limit? Well, to building solid. Yeah. If I'm gonna, if I'm thinking I want to fire it solid, and not hollow it out, I would, uh, I would maybe an, an inch or two thick. I can kind of get away with poking it with a needle and firing it. Um, I wouldn't go any more than that. And with 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 my class, I try to keep them down to about an inch thick at the most. Uh, but with some of the bigger pieces, whether I work hollow or solid, it's more about whether I want it to to look proportionally <clears throat> tight and correct or a little bit distorted and loose. Um, so for me, working solid, I can, I, can, I can work a little loose, but I can also get the proportion and the position, the gesture really nice. Uh, I have a little less control when I pinch hollow. And so I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, like with the bronze piece, I worked it solid, so I had a little more control. I think I have more control when I work solid. Mm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In the Dear. comments, Janine said, wow, thanks for including that photo from Syria. Isn't it incredible that after the hell that Syria has experienced, one of the most devastated places on earth, that they can enjoy an, an empathy for George Floyd, an amazing worldwide web of compassion and shared love for justice, freedom, and equality. Bravo. That was from Janine. Any other questions for Joe? Questions or comments? Thank you, Janine. Okay. I had a question. Hey, John. Is that Hi. John? Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I really loved your uh, thoughts on community and COVID and really excited to see where your new pieces go. Um, I did have a question on one of your first pieces you were showing where you um, kind of made them different uh, different pieces to fire and then as assembled later, like the mm -hmm. head and hands are different. No. Do you think, uh, when, I guess this is just a technical question. When you fire those, do you have to, do you fire them as separate pieces? Do you have to make little stands like for the heads and hands um, to go on or because it's the raw clay, how does, how does that work? Um, <clears throat> you mean just in terms of, so they don't warp, so they'll fit later, is that what you mean? Uh, just so that, um, I guess I don't know what the insides look like so that they can stand up or lean in the kiln. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, well, it really, it totally depends on the situation. Like, like with the head, there'll be a, a part of the joint coming down from the neck that goes inside the body a lot of times. And so I can't just stand it on that. Uh, sometimes I'll make a... Uh, Ne uh, negative that that can sit in that's separate from the, the torso and I'll fire them together uh, or sometimes I'll just put the head upside down and just fire it up you know that way uh, so I, I have to kind of improvise I do have stilts and if I need need to I'll use them sometimes to, to you know hold them in place but usually they're the piece is too heavy to do that uh, my biggest concern is warpage so that you know, after the fire, that thing won't fit anymore. And then I've got a grinder, you know, for 10 hours trying to make it fit. And so fortunately, I don't fire to maturity. So my clay doesn't move that much uh, when I fire it. Um, that helps a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's total improvisation. Uh, and if needed, I'll build a, I'll build a temporary uh, negative to fit that. Like, uh, like I was saying, so hopefully that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, too. Got a couple more comments. Um, Jennifer said, Jennifer Bernie said, thank you. I feel like I had to say her last name because that's like how I like, I feel like we know her as Jennifer Bernie. Anyway, sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for sharing your influences. These are new artists to me, and I appreciate seeing the connections to your work. Jason De 
Cares Taylor blew my mind. Sorry, I don't know how to say that name. From Mary, thank you for providing an update on your thinking and work. Janine said, love your work too, Joe. Thank you for sharing it. I'm a ceramist too, or was, don't have my own equipment. And I have a vision to do some creatures which you've helped me imagine, as I don't see doing solid figures, but maybe, but might. Is there a metric at all for how large a piece you can do solid and when you have to hollow it out? I don't know if that's a similar question to Ray's question, but I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all. Yeah. Um, well, like I was saying, when I when I work hollow versus solid, it's, it's more about the feeling of the work. Do I want it to be, um, do I want more control? Then I'd probably work solid. Do I, am I okay with it a little less controlled than I work than I pinch? But you can really do it any way you want. You can work as big as you want either way. But if you work in solid, you might you might find that you need an armature. Um, Aisha Harrison does work solid on most of her work and builds elaborate, amazing uh, armatures to go inside. Uh, so does uh, Beth Kavanagh, Stichter, and a lot of a lot of folks. Uh, Mike Moran, from who used to teach at Evergreen, did as well. And uh, he did some temporary ones. So he would just jam a piece of uh, PVC pipe into the work or something, and then and then pull it back up, pull it out when when the piece was firm enough. Uh, but but it, you can do it however you want, really. It's just clay, so it's a matter of uh, what you ultimately want to end up with. There is a thing about like some people just prefer pinching, and they do it really well. They don't have any problem controlling it. I have a little trouble controlling it because the clay shrinks. Uh, it's like trying to do a drawing when you can't see the other half of the paper or something. And, and so there, it, it, there's something about finding the thing that works for you uh, as well with this. So um, that's a really vague meandering answer. I hope, it, I hope that it helped a little bit. Joe, I know obviously we've all had our lives kind of interrupted. So this you might not have an answer for this question, but is there, besides the Percival landing, is there anywhere else that people can look forward to seeing you in the near or not so near under the circumstances future? Uh, yeah, if you're up uh, Fort Townsend, some of the, the uh, congregation, the small figure pieces will be up there uh, in December at uh, the, I, oh, I can't remember the name of the place. I think it's something like the Northwest Art Center or something like that. And uh, if all goes well, there'll, there'll probably be a, a couple of things up at uh, uh, Contemporary Visions in Bremerton in wintertime. And then um, what I'd really like to do is put my whole congregation up somewhere outside in town uh, and do a little really quick kind of pop-up version of that show outside on on a parking lot and so that's what I'll probably be doing um, but you're always welcome to go to my website joebatceramics.com as well um, yes those are the things that come to mind off the top of my head all right well thank you so much for sharing everything with us today and I loved seeing your inspiration artist. I think you might be the first person to do that. That might not be true um, in the some things. Any last questions for Joe or Joe, any last comments before hopefully everyone will take a few minutes to be guided out by Banjo? I just, I just want to say thanks to people uh, for, for coming. I know we're all zoomed out, so I'm really amazed that people were able to take some time. It's good to see you all. I want to give a particular shout out to Claire, who's in my class. Thanks for coming, Claire. But thank you to you all. Uh, it's lovely to, to, to be with you a little bit here. And thanks, Nicole, for the opportunity. My pleasure. Um, in the comments, got a couple more comments. Melissa says, thanks so much, Joe. It was really fun to see your work alongside your history and inspirations. I love your grandma's art. And Claire says, hello, exclamation point. Thanks everyone for coming. Oh, Terry says, thank you, Joe. All right, so as people exit, uh, feel free to, to slowly exit. I'll, I will play my banjo for a couple of minutes. 
And uh, I'll just apologize in, van in advance because there's no way you can stop me from playing this thing. sing along. <laughs> All right. Woo! Wow, thanks for listening to that. I thought people would rush out once I started. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, round of applause. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end the call now. Thank you, everyone.